Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to study is a concept known as the center of a group. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the definition of what the center of a group is. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll see that the center of a group is in fact a subgroup of the group. Okay, and then we'll talk about the center of a group in an abelian group. Okay, right, so let's start off then uh, with the definition of the centre of a group. So firstly, uh, to discuss this, we need to have a group, uh, an arbitrary group. So let's say the arbitrary group that we're working with is called capital G. Okay, and by now we know that this arbitrary group will consist of a set of symbols, okay, which I'll draw here, along with a composition table defined on the uh, symbols in this set, Okay, uh, which allows us to compose together any two elements of the set and get another element of the set. So here is our arbitrary group, capital G, which is a set of symbols with this composition law defined on it, and this composition law needs to obey the axioms of group theory. Okay, right, uh, so we've got our arbitrary group. What then is the centre of this arbitrary group? What is the definition of the centre of a group? Okay, well firstly, it is written Z of G, like so. Okay, so this is how you write the centre of a group. Okay, so when you see Z, G, like so, it means the centre of the group, capital G. Okay, and this is going to be a subset of the set that underlies the group, capital G. And in fact, what we're going to see is that it's a very special subset of the uh, set that underlies the group, capital G. It's actually a subgroup of capital G. But first and foremost, we'll see that it is just a subset of capital G. So the centre of a group is a subset of the group. Okay, now which elements then of the group are actually put in the centre of the group? Okay, which elements of the group have the honour of being in this subset which we are calling the centre of the group? Okay, well the definition then of the centre of a group is that it is a set containing all elements of the group. So all little g that are an element of the group capital G which satisfy a certain condition Okay, and the condition that an element of the group must satisfy in order to qualify for being in the centre of the group is that it must be the case that G composed with S, and I won't write the composition symbol, I'll just write the two elements of the group next to each other to denote composition, must equal S composed with G for absolutely all little s is an element, is an element of the group. Okay, so basically you go through absolutely all the elements of the group and you ask, um, does this element commute with absolutely all other elements of the group, all little s uh, that are other elements of the group? And if that is the case, then you stick that element into this set that we are calling the centre of the group. Okay. So, let me give you an intuitive picture of what it means for an element of the group to actually be within the centre of the group. What it means for an element of the group to meet this condition. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll draw out the composition table of the group bigger now. So I've taken this here and I'm drawing it out now bigger. Okay, so I'll just colour code this in in red here. Okay, now if an element, little g, of the group is going to actually be in the centre of the group, then what that actually means is that it really does not matter what order you compose little g with any element of the group. You can do it in either order and the answer will be the same. Now what does that mean in terms of the composition table here? Well, it means that the row dedicated to the element little g is going to be absolutely identical to the column dedicated to little g. Okay, so let me just draw this out and then I'll explain exactly what I mean by this. Okay, so in the composition table, what we know is that we have all the elements of the group up here. So every element of the group is going to be given a um, column dedicated to it. So we've got all the elements of the group up here given a column that is dedicated to them. Okay. In addition, we have all the elements of the group over here, and they're all given a row that is dedicated to them. Okay, now let's suppose that when we uh, 
produce this composition table, when we write out this composition table, we are feeling in a sensible mood, and we stick the elements of the group in the same order in, the, in this portion as we do in this portion. So when we're ascribing elements of the group columns, we're going to put them in the same order as when we ascribe them all rows. Okay, so the elements of the group appear in the same order from here to here as they do from here to here. Okay, now what it means for an element of the group, little g, to be in the center of the group then, is that this column dedicated to little g, all the elements of the group must appear in this column in the same order as they would in this row from here to here, basically. Okay, now let's think about why that is the case. Because if we take this side of this equation, firstly, g composed with little s, where little s is an arbitrary element of the group, what we're doing is we are left multiplying any element of the group by this element of the group, little g. Okay, so we're going through every single element of the group here, and we're saying we'll multiply little g by all of those elements of the group. Okay, so just to colour this in, this side here in yellow corresponds to this row dedicated to the element little g here. Okay. Meanwhile, the right-hand side here, what we're doing is we're going through every element of the group. So here is our little s here, and we are this time right multiplying them by the element little g. Okay, so this corresponds to this column here. Okay, and basically, if it's going to be the case that gs must equal sg, then what must be the case is that this row dedicated to little g, the elements of the group must appear in exactly the same order in this row as they do in this column. So basically, the row and the column must be the mirror image of one another along this diagonal line here, basically. So the row and column dedicated to the element little g must be symmetric uh, along this diagonal line down the composition table, and that's the condition for the element little g to actually be in the centre of the group, basically. Okay, and I should stress again that uh, that assumes that we have the elements of the group uh, up here in the same order as we have down here. Okay, so we've designed the composition table sensibly, basically. Okay, right, so that's the intuitive picture of what it means uh, for uh, an element of the centre of the group to commute with all the other elements of the group. Okay, right, uh, so what we now want to see is that the centre of the group, which we know is a subset of our group capital G, is actually a subgroup of capital G. So what we want to see is that the centre of the group, ZG here, is in fact a subgroup of capital G. It's more than just a subset, it's a special subset, it's actually a subgroup. Okay, right, so let's go through uh, the axioms of group theory and make sure that the centre of the group here actually does obey uh, the axioms of group theory. So remember, to be a subgroup, uh, you have to be a subset which is special because this subset with the inherited composition law from the bigger group uh, is actually a group in its own right, it obeys the axioms of group theory. So we need to make sure that the centre of the group with the inherited composition law from the larger group actually does obey the axioms of group theory. Okay, now remember there are four axioms of group theory, but when we're checking that a subset is a subgroup, we don't need to worry about the second axiom of group theory, because we instantly get that the second axiom of group theory must uh, be satisfied, um, because if it wasn't satisfied on that inherited composition law from the larger group, then it would be the case that the uh, composition law in the larger group didn't actually obey associativity. So we don't need to worry about the second axiom of group theory, which is always the case when we're checking that a subset is a subgroup. Okay, so let's check axiom number one, three, and four then of group theory. So axiom number one, firstly, a very important one. Okay, so axiom number one is closure. Okay, so this says basically that if you take two elements, let's say G1 and G2, from the subset, so we'll take G1 and G2 from the centre of the group, Okay, so we'll have some arbitrary G1 and an arbitrary G2 from the centre of the group. Okay, so these are elements that commute with all other elements of the group. What we now want to show 
is that if we compose those two together, so if we take G1 composed with G2, and I'll just write them next to each other for composed, Okay, we want to show that this is also going to be an element of the centre of the group. So we want to show that if we compose any two elements of the centre of the group together, we'll end up with another element of the centre of the group. Okay, right, so let's go. So how are we going to show this? Well, let's just use the very definition of this element being in the centre of the group. So if we want to show that G1 composed with G2 is an element of the centre of the group, what we need to show is that for all little s that you can possibly come up with from the group, it needs to be the case that G1, G2, s, so G1, G2 composed with s, is equal to s, G1, G2, so s composed with G1, G2 the other way around. Okay, so this is what we need to make sure of. Okay, so... How are we going to actually show this? Well, let's consider the left-hand side here. So let's consider G1 composed with G2 composed with S, where S is some arbitrary element of the group. Okay, what is this going to be equal to? We're trying to show that this is equal to this. Okay, so how, how can we go? Where can we go with this? Well, all we've been given is that G1 and G2 are both elements of the centre of the group. We must have to use that in some way. Okay, so... What we can then do is we can think, okay, this is G1 composed with G2 composed with S. Let's imagine putting the brackets around G2 composed with S. We know that group composition obeys associativity, so we don't need to worry about um, where we put the brackets. We can put them wherever we like. So we can put them around G2 composed with S, okay? And then what we can say is G2 composed with S that must be the same thing as S composed with G2, because G2 is an element of the centre of the group, so commutes with any element of the group, uh, little s. Okay, so what I can now do is rewrite this as being G1, S, G2. Okay, and that's perfectly valid. I haven't broken any rules there. G1, G2, S is the same as G1, S, G2. Now what I can do is I can associate G1 and S together and say, okay, now what I can do is say that G1 composed with S is the same as S composed with G1, uh, because again, G1 is an element of the centre of the group and therefore must commute with all the elements of the group, little s. So I can then rewrite this as S, G1, G2. So what I have just shown you is that because G1 and G2 are elements of the centre of the group, you can instantly show that G1 composed with G2 is also an element of the centre of the group. Okay, so G1, G2, S is equal to S, G1, G2 for all little G1 and little G2 that you could possibly come up with from the centre of the group and for all little S in the group. Okay, so that's uh, done. Okay, so we've shown now that if you compose two elements of the centre of the group together, you do indeed get another element of the centre of the group. Okay, we miss out axiom number two because we know we get that instantly. Let's now do axiom number three of group theory. So we need to make sure that the identity element uh, from our larger group is in the centre of the group, and that will become our identity element within the centre of the group, which we are claiming is a subgroup. Okay, so um, why then is the identity element within the centre of the group? Well, all we need to do is discuss why the identity satisfies the definition for being in the centre of the group. Well, the definition of the for to be in the centre of the group is that you commute with all the other elements of the group. Okay, well this should be very easy. The identity composed with S is equal to S composed with the identity for all S is an element of the group is what we want to show. Okay, well let's do this quite simply by evaluating the left hand side, evaluate the right hand side and show that they have to be equal to one another. Okay, so firstly let's start off with the left hand side. The identity composed with little s, where little s is some arbitrary element of the group, is absolutely always going to equal little s, because that's the very definition of the identity element. It composes with any other element in the group to give that other element of the group back again. Okay, the right hand side then now, s composed with the identity, again that is just equal to s, no matter what little s you pick. Okay, again, that's just the definition of the identity. So quite clearly, the identity element does commute with all the other elements of the group. Okay, so the identity element is indeed always an element of the centre of the group. So in any group, you will always have at least one element in the centre of the group, which will be the identity element. 
Okay, right. And the final axiom of group theory, the fourth axiom, okay, we need to show that all elements within the centre of the group have an inverse element that is also in the centre of the group. So we need to show that if we take an arbitrary little g that is in the centre of the group, okay, so for all little g is an element at the centre of the group, that the inverse element is also an element of the centre of the group. Okay, what we know is that the inverse element g inverse will be an element of the group but we don't necessarily know that it will be an element of the centre of the group. So what we want to show is that G inverse is automatically also an element of the centre of the group. OK, same technique as always. We're just going to now say what's the condition for G inverse to be in the centre of the group and why is it going to be true that that uh, condition is met. OK, so we're going to want to prove then that G inverse composed with S is equal to S composed with G inverse for all little s is an element of the group. So we want to prove that G inverse commutes with absolutely all elements of the group if little g commutes with all the elements of the group. OK, so what we'll do is we'll take the left hand side here, G inverse composed with S, where S is some arbitrary element of the group, and we want to turn it into the right hand side. We want to show that it will be equal to the right hand side here. And what we have, let's remember what we have to work with. We have to work with the fact that little g is an element of the centre of the group. OK, and that tells us that little g composed with little s is equal to little s composed with little g for all little s is an element of the group. OK, right, so how am I going to do this then? Well, what I'm going to do is a very clever trick. OK, and I really like this little trick. This is fantastic. OK, this is really nifty. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I can rewrite G inverse composed with S as G inverse composed with S composed with G, G inverse. OK, it's absolutely fine for you to do that. It looks as though we've gone from something simple to something much more complicated, but I haven't broken any rules here. You can't stop me from doing that. OK, you might not have thought of doing that, but you can't stop me from doing that. OK. I can put g, g inverse here because this just evaluates to the identity. So all I've done effectively is compose this with the identity. So this truly is equal to this. OK, but now what can I do? I can apply this fact here and I can say, OK, now I'm going to replace s composed with g here with g composed with s. OK, so what I can do is I can turn this into g inverse composed with g composed with s composed with g inverse like so. OK, so I've swapped those two around using the fact that the element little g is an element of the centre of the group. So there's where I've used the fact that g is an element of the centre of the group. OK, now what I can do is say, OK, g inverse composed with g, that's just the identity, so let's drop that. That's equal to s composed with g inverse, which is exactly what I wanted to show. I've now taken the left-hand side and turned it into the right-hand side of this equation. And I've therefore shown that if little g is an element of the centre of the group, that little g inverse is also then an element of the centre of the group, that indeed it does commute with every other element of the group. OK, so what I now have done then is shown the centre of the group, which is the subset of the group, capital G. That's obvious just from the very definition. But what wasn't obvious is that this actually is a subgroup with the inherited composition law from the larger group. So what we've now proven is that the centre of the group is in fact a subgroup of the larger group, capital G. OK, right. Uh, one final comment that I want to make on this video, and I should say that this video is just intended to introduce the concept of a centre of a group. We're not going to show why this concept is so important yet. We'll use it in upcoming videos and we'll see why it's such an important concept. But the final comment that I want to put in this introductory video is what if G is an abelian group? OK, now remember, a group is abelian if it's commutative. OK, so a group being abelian means that uh, for any little g1 and little g2 in the group, OK, so I'll put this for all g1 and g2 that we have within the group, g1 composed with g2 is the same as g2 composed with g1. OK, so the entire group composition table is symmetric down the diagonal line if we're working in an abelian group. OK, so 
if we're working in the abelian group, then the centre of that abelian group is going to be the entire group, because every single element of the group composes commutatively with every other element of the group. So all of the elements of the group uh, satisfy the condition that you need to obey in order to be in the centre of the group if we're in an abelian group. Okay, and quite simply, the easiest way to think of that is in terms of this picture interpretation of the condition to be in the centre of the group, where the column and the row corresponding to the element have to be symmetric down the diagonal line. In an abelian group, the entire composition table is symmetric down the diagonal line, so all of the uh, columns uh, are the image of the uh, rows when they've been uh, reflected in this diagonal line. So all of the elements of the group meet the condition to be in the centre of the group. Okay, right, so we will end um, this introductory video to the concept of a centre of a group uh, at uh, that.